Today's theme is very simple, scary stories. But before I get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please eat all of the like buttons Oreos except for one and put it back in the pantry and then also crumple all of their potato chips. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. In 2010, an avid caver named Jeff decided to go to Madagascar to explore a natural cave shaft he had discovered years earlier. He arrived in country, he got a rental car, and he hired a guide to take him out to the area where he knew this cave was gonna be. When he got out to that area, he used his notebook where he had taken notes the last time he was here, and he used that to find the opening to the cave. He paid the guide to stick around at the car while he went down and explored this cave. He ensured him it was not gonna be for a very long time. The shaft was approximately 50 meters deep and one meter across so it's pretty narrow and the first 20 meters of the descent are on a bit of an angle and then the final 30 meters are down at a straight vertical drop at the bottom of this cave was this opening where you could actually stand up and walk around but there were no other tunnels to explore at the bottom so you would just go down touch the bottom and go back up the visibility inside of the shaft was limited because all you had was the light that was coming in and because of how narrow the opening was Jeff's body would obscure a lot of the sunlight coming in so once Jeff got a few meters down into the tunnel, he would rely on his headlamp. So Jeff enters the cave and he makes his way down to the 20 meter mark. So that's where the tunnel goes from being on an angle to being straight. And he's about to make that final descent down that final 30 meters when he notices something out of the corner of his eye. And he focuses his light on the side of the shaft and he sees thousands of black widow spiders trying to escape the light. They're scattering all over the walls. And he looks around him and he realizes from his position down on the vertical section of the shaft is covered in black widow spiders. As much as Jeff wanted to stop right there and go right back up to the surface, he couldn't. In order to go back up this line that he was rappelling down on, he needed technical gear. And his technical gear was packed in his backpack, and it would just be totally unsafe trying to fish it out of his bag. And so he would have to descend the final 30 meters to the bottom, then take his pack off, get the gear out, and go back up. So Jeff took a deep breath, and he began his slow, awful descent into this cave filled with spiders. And periodically, as he would bump into the wall, he'd hear them scatter all over the walls. And then he saw them climbing on his sleeves and he'd have to brush them off his sleeves. He saw them on the rope, he's trying to brush them off. He finally gets to the bottom and he can hear the spiders on the wall just crawling all over the place. He takes his bag off and it's covered in spiders. He opens it up, spiders crawl out of his bag. He carefully reaches in and pulls out his technical gear. He throws it up and he begins making his way back up. And the whole time he's just brushing spiders off of him. Once he gets to the surface, the first thing he does is he strips all of his clothing off to get all the spiders off of his clothing. He takes his bag, dumps it out, more spiders are in there. After he finally brushes all the spiders off, he redresses and gets in the car. And you can only imagine what the guide was thinking as he's watching this guy, this foreigner, taking his clothes off after being in this cave. But luckily he doesn't get bit. He gets in the car with the guide and they start heading back towards the city. As they're driving, he takes his notebook out and he scratches off the title he had given this cave from the last time he was here, which was the Crooked Tube. He scratches that out and on top of it, he writes, the entrance to hell. In 2006, a 14 year old boy named Evan lived on a farm in North Carolina. This was not a typical farm with animals and crops. It was a pine tree harvestry. Pine needles are a big landscaping commodity and Evan and his family made their living baling pine straw every year. As such, their main living house on the farm was situated right in the middle of 550 acres of perfectly lined up pine trees. They did not have any neighbors nearby and there was only one road that led into the property, which from the main house, they could look out and basically see through the rows of trees all the way to the beginning of this road which meant any visitors were really easy to spot. The main house was built on a very slight hill, which meant one side of the house was effectively built on stilts to compensate for the angle. And on that side of the house, on the first floor, was the living room. So anyone who was in the living room looking out the window, they basically need to look at a downward angle to see the ground. It would actually seem like you were on the second floor, but really you're on the first floor. The window in the living room was very unique. It stretched almost the entire length of the room, so almost 50 
50 feet across. And at night, you could see animals darting between the different trees because you could see down the rows. And so that was pretty creepy. And then just the fact that this window is so big, if you're in the living room at night, you just felt really exposed. So between the creepy animals running around and the level of exposure and vulnerability, people basically avoided the living room anytime they were in the house at night. That winter, Evan's cousin came to stay with him on his farm, and because the main house did not have any extra bedrooms, Evan and his cousin would have to sleep in the living room. There were two couches inside of the living room, one that was right underneath the 50 foot long window, and then another which was on the other side of the room against a wall that did not have a window. And so Evan would be sleeping on the couch right under the window, and his cousin would be sleeping on the other couch. The first night Evan's cousin was there, they put this big sheet up over the window, but it only blocked like 75% of the window. The two flanks of the window were still exposed, but where the couches were lined up, they were kind of blocked by this sheet. So it gave them a little bit of privacy. After goofing around for a while, the boys finally fell asleep around midnight. And then they woke up a couple hours later because they heard Evan's dogs barking way off in the pine trees. Now, Evan was used to his dogs running around the property and barking at other smaller animals. And so just them barking was not necessarily a red flag. But the barking persisted to the point where Evan's cousin got up off the couch, moved across the room to the opening of the window that was not covered by the sheet at the foot of where Evan was sleeping. Now, Evan was still laying on the couch. He was not going to get up and look out the window. So he's looking down at his cousin, kind of looking at his face to get some sort of a read on what he's seeing. And he notices his cousin has this really perplexed look on his face, like he's squinting his eyes and trying to make sense of what he's looking at. And so Evan looks at him and says, hey, what's going on? What do you see? And his cousin's like, I don't know if my mind's playing tricks on me or not, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I see people out there. At this, Evan jumps off the couch and runs over and butts up right next to his cousin so he can look out the window too. And he's scanning out amongst the rows of trees because there's just a mile of pine trees. And the first thing he notices is the moon is very bright that night. So there's good illumination and there was a light snow covering on the ground, which really added to the illumination. He's looking out maybe a hundred meters when he sees someone's leg extend from behind one of the pine trees as if they're stepping into the space between a pine tree column. And he's staring at it and he can't believe he's even seeing anyone walking around this area because he didn't see anybody come in on the road and they have no neighbors. And so he's looking and then a body follows the leg. A person walks from one row to the next. This tall, dark figure just walks calm as can be between the two pine trees. And Evan just grabs his cousin and he's like, did you just see that? And his cousin's like, yeah, I saw that. And so they continue to look in the direction of where this person crossed the path. And after a couple of minutes, they see another leg now emerging, going the other way back towards where that first person had come from. So the leg kind of extends into this gap and this tall figure walks across into the next row, except now, instead of going just directly across, it looks like they're moving at an angle closer to the main house property. The boys look at each other and they don't know what to do. So they just keep looking out the window in stunned silence. And as they're looking, they see this person emerge again, except now they're not 100 meters away. They're like 20 meters away. They don't know how they were able to move that quickly without being seen. And this time when the leg comes out from behind the pine tree, instead of walking across the gap, it stops right in the middle and it turns and it looks directly at the boys in the window and then begins running toward them. The boys practically fall over trying to get away from the window. Evan's yelling for his father upstairs and the boys instinctively just start running around the house, locking every door, shutting every window. And as they're going from door to door, the anxiety is growing and growing because they think if I don't get there fast enough, this person who was running towards the property is gonna come barging through that door. And so at every door, their anxiety is through the roof, but they manage to shut everything, everything is locked right as Evan's father comes charging down the stairs. He's got his gun in hand and he's like, what's going on? And they say, there's someone out in our property. Their dad charges out the front door. The front door is not on the same wall as the living room. It's on the side of the house. So once he goes outside, he's going to need to turn to the right to look out in the direction they were describing. He bombs outside. He stays in the porch and he starts yelling at whoever's out there that if you come over here, I'm going to shoot you. Get the F away from here. And then there's silence. And the boys are waiting, they're looking around, they're checking the window, they don't see anything. The dad comes back inside, he shut and locks the door, and he tells Evan, keep an eye out, if you see him again, you let me know. Evan would reflect on this experience later on and say, you know, we really should have called 911 at that point, but as a kid, I just understood that that's the way my family did business. We kind of took care of ourselves. And so even though there is a threat 
of some stranger who's running at our property, we were not gonna call the cops. And so his dad effectively was telling him to be a lookout. And so Evan and his cousin, they go back into the living room and they kind of go up to the window. They're a little bit apprehensive and they're looking out. And, and after five, 10 minutes of looking out the window and not seeing anything, they're thinking to themselves, you know, Evan's dad's a pretty intimidating guy. And he was just out there screaming and yelling with a gun, threatening to shoot them. So they probably got the message and they're probably gone. And so the boys got back into their couches and it took them a while, but they did ultimately fall asleep. The next morning when the boys got up, the first thing they wanted to do was go out there and see if they could find footprints from this person to kind of confirm it really was a person because part of them thought, you know, maybe we didn't see that. Maybe that was our imaginations. They don't know. And so they start by going out the front door. So not on the same wall as the living room. They go out the front door, they turn and they walk down into the trees and they're looking around and they find some footprints. So they're confirming to themselves, okay, there was someone out here. It wasn't us. This is not our footprints. We found them. So they start following the footprints back towards the property. And they realize at some point there are two distinct sets of footprints. There were two people out here. And even worse is they followed them all the way up to the house. And there were two different circles of footprints that stopped right underneath the living room window along the two flanks of the window where the sheet was not covering. Which means over the course of the night when Evan and his cousin were up at that window looking out, there's a good chance that one or two strangers were tucked up against the side of the house and they would not have seen them because of the angle out of the living room window. It was steep because of the stilts it was on. And so anybody that was tucked up along the side, they'd be in a blind spot. And then for sure, after Evan and his cousin got back into bed and were sleeping, there were two strangers who were right up against those windows, probably pulling themselves up to look inside. When Evan's father found these footprints, he immediately grabbed his gun and tried to follow them back into the woods to see where they came from. But unfortunately, the snow cover wasn't complete. And at some point they lost the tracks and they never figured out who those two people were. Evan would say following this event, his cousin refused to ever come back over his house for a sleepover. In October of 2005, a 21-year-old named Nathan was back home in Elk Grove, California, visiting his mother at her apartment for a couple of days. Her apartment was part of this really safe complex. It was gated. There's lots of lights and cameras. So anything that went bump in the night was just going to be, you know, your noisy neighbors or something. On the last night of Nathan's stay, he was laying in his bed in the guest room, listening to the hum of the street lamp that was outside and the crickets and the, the passing by of cars when he drifted off to sleep. At about 2 a.m., Nathan woke up, or so he thought. He couldn't move his body, he could only move his eyes, and even though he had never experienced sleep paralysis before, he instinctively understood this is probably that. He noticed the room was completely silent. There was no more crickets, no more hum of the light outside, no more traffic, just total silence. And then he started flashing his eyes around the room because he couldn't move his head or his body. And he started taking stock of the room. The bed he was in was positioned as far away from the door as he could in the back right corner. From where he was laying, if he looked to his right, in that corner was this big armoire. And then moving left from the armoire as he scanned the room, you'd come to the door, which is on the opposite side of where his bed was. And then if he kept scanning left, he would reach the foot of his bed. And just beyond the foot of his bed was a table and a chair. But because he was laying flat, he couldn't really look down and actually see the table and chair. And so with all of his strength, he managed to raise his head just enough that he had a line of sight to that section of his room, the only section he has not looked at yet. And he sees the table and chair, and he sees in the corner is this dark figure that's standing there looking at him. He's completely frozen with fear. His thought is there's an intruder in the house. How did they get in here? What are they doing in here? And he managed to keep his head up just long enough to get a decent look at this dark figure. And he determined it was most likely a woman with a shawl covering her face. And before his head fell back to the pillow, he saw her suddenly crouch down on the ground out of view. And then Nathan's head fell back. And now he knows there's just some stranger in his room and he can't lift his head up anymore. And he's looking around with his eyes. He sees the armoire, he sees the door, he he can't see that table and chair and then he hears the sound of someone slithering along the ground out of view and he can hear her breathing as she's getting closer and closer to the edge of the bed and he's laying there terrified he's so scared he can't even make a sound and he's telling himself this has to be a dream wake up wake up wake up and he's laying there and this woman she stands up and she leans out over his bed and she looks at him and her face is pale and her eyes are sunk way back in her head and then she begins to slowly crawl on top of him and nathan's sitting here looking at this woman he wants to close his eyes but he can't and he just feels his chest being pressed down he 
can hear the sounds of the springs compressing all around him as this woman positions herself on his chest. And then he finally manages to let out a scream and then suddenly he's awake. The woman's gone. And he sits up and he's looking around. There's nobody in his room. The familiar hum of the light and the crickets and the traffic outside, they all return. And his mom comes running in the room and she's like, hey, are you okay? I heard screaming in here. And he said, oh no, I, I, had a, I had a bad dream. I'm fine now. I had a terrible dream, but I'm fine now. And his mom's like, okay, uh, all right, you, you need anything? And he's like, nope. So she comes over, she gives him a hug and a kiss. She goes back to bed and he would go downstairs, flip on a Disney movie, actually Aladdin, and he would fall asleep with a Disney movie on and with lights on. And there was no more sleep paralysis that night. The next day, Nathan got up and he headed back to his house and he really, he couldn't shake the experience. He had never had sleep paralysis before, but it was just so much more terrifying than he ever would have imagined. And he's just thinking to himself, I can't believe there are people that put up with this on any sort of regular basis. But, you know, after a couple of days and getting home and not experiencing any sleep paralysis, you know, time went on and he just kind of forgot about it. A few months later, in March of 2006, Nathan is at this big family party in Chico, California, big outdoor barbecue, all of his family's there. And at some point, his sister shows up. His sister was not supposed to be attending this party. So it was a, it was a great surprise. He hasn't seen her in a while. And he immediately pulls her aside to catch up with her. And so for the first hour of their conversation, they're just chatting about their lives and what they're up to. Towards the end of their conversation, Nathan suddenly felt compelled to share his sleep paralysis experience with his sister. And the reason he wanted to was because he knew that she knew that he was actually a skeptic. And so she would believe him. If he's telling her this is what happened, she would believe that that's what he saw. And so he starts by saying, you know, I had the weirdest experience at mom's apartment just a couple of months ago. I'm pretty sure it was sleep paralysis. And his sister immediately butts in and she goes, wait a minute. I had sleep paralysis for the first time in my life two weeks ago at mom's apartment. It was horrible. I was in the guest room and then I saw this, this woman and she was like standing on me. I thought I was gonna die. It was horrible. That's exactly what happened to me. I was laying in the guest room and I couldn't move. And then I saw a woman in the corner and she, she stood on my chest. They proceeded to go over all the details of each of their stories and they discovered that they had had almost the exact same experience. And at the end of it, they wanted to have a rational explanation for how they both could just somehow have their only sleep paralysis experience in the same room in roughly the same timeline and experience the exact same events. They were trying to, you know, come up with a, with a rational explanation for that, but it was just too much of a coincidence. But ultimately, neither of them were really prepared to start discussing what else it could be. So they decided to just kind of laugh it off and say, man, that's pretty weird. And they moved on. After the party was over, Nathan would go back to his house and he would tell his wife about this crazy coincidence he and his sister had had. And his wife would say, yeah, that, that's wild. But after that, Nathan just did not want to think about it or talk about it. And so he kind of just, you know, pushed it out of his mental space and did forget about it. He moved on. Five months later, in August of 2006, Nathan's mom would move out of that apartment building and she would move into a two-story house still in Elk Grove, California. Shortly after she moved in, she asked Nathan if he would come spend a couple nights with her. And Nathan said, sure. In order to better understand what happens to Nathan over the course of his stay at his mother's new house, you need to understand a basic layout of her house. So when you walk through her double doors, to your left is gonna be a formal living room. In the center of the house is a hallway that shoots straight back to the kitchen. And then to your right, right when you walk in, there's a wall. And on that wall is the stairs leading up to the second floor. If you take those stairs to the second floor, you reach a landing where there's a window that looks back into the backyard and immediately to your right, there is a single door and that's the master bedroom where Nathan's mom would sleep. From the landing, if you turned left, there'd be another door that's a mirror image of the master bedroom door. And this door is the guest room. That's where Nathan was gonna stay. And then to the left of the guest room was a hall that went to the front of the house, but that's irrelevant to the story. If you went inside the guest room, the bed was located in the back right corner. So the same layout as the guest room in the apartment building where the person laying in the bed, so Nathan, his feet would be closest to the door. And from Nathan's perspective in the bed, the only other piece of furniture in this new house guest room was a table that was from his perspective on the right hand wall centered on the wall and on the table was a TV. So that's the only things in the room. The first night Nathan was at this new house was totally uneventful. The second night, not so much. He was up in the guest room, laying on the bed, watching TV, 
the lights are off, it's just the TV on, and at some point he dozes off. He wakes up a short time later and he can't move. It's the same sensation he had when he was staying with his mom at her apartment. And he begins to panic because the last time he felt this way, a strange veiled woman stood on his chest and made it feel like he was dying. And so immediately he's trying to move his body, he can't. And so using his eyes, he starts looking around the room praying this woman is not in the room with him. And so he looks to the right, to that corner, which he can see, there's no one there. From this corner, he starts scanning across the room. He sees the TV, it's still on. He keeps scanning and he sees the door and it's open. And then he scans and he's able to just barely make out the space at the foot of the bed. He can actually see to the corner and this woman, she's not in here. And so initially he feels incredibly relieved that she's not in the room with him. But then he finds himself focusing on the open door into the dark hallway. And he's thinking to himself, please, please do not come walking through that door. And so he stares at the open door, just hoping he breaks out of the sleep paralysis when he notices something about the TV. It's flickering. And so he averts his gaze to the TV and he realizes what he's looking at on TV does not look familiar. It does not look like a, a TV show. It looks like CCTV camera footage. Like it looks like a security camera footage. And he realizes the footage he's looking at is the inside of his mother's kitchen downstairs. He recognized the way it was laid out. That's his mother's house, that's downstairs. And he's staring at the footage thinking, why is this footage playing on the TV? And I don't think there's a camera down there. When he notices on the camera, the woman with the veil walks into the middle of the frame and she looks up at the camera right as the camera turns off. And then the room is completely dark. There's no more ambient light in the room. The hallway is dark and he's left paralyzed knowing this woman is downstairs in the kitchen and as he's laying there he hears her start running through the house and it sounds like an animal is barreling into things as she's running through the bottom floor and she stops at the foot of the stairs and he's thinking to himself I know where she's going she's coming up to my room and so as he's laying there he feels his heart racing and he's staring at the open door he knows she's gonna come flying up those stairs and she's gonna come through that door and instead of running up the stairs he hears her take one step Two step. And as she's making her way up the stairs, he's just thinking, please break out of this trance, stop this paralysis, wake up, wake up. And then he sees her head emerge and she turns to look at him from the stairs into the room. And once she sees it's him, she bolts around and starts charging into the room on all fours like an animal. At this point, Nathan lets out a primal scream. He is scared for his life as this woman is charging towards him and she stops dead in her tracks right in the middle of the room. She looks at him, turns around, and crashes out of the room, charges downstairs, and then it's silent. As soon as she was downstairs, Nathan could sit up, except it did not feel like the first time he had sleep paralysis at his mom's apartment when he sat up and he had the sensation of, of relief. You've woken up, you were asleep before, now you're awake. This time, it was like he was always awake, but now he can sit up. He did not have a sense of relief. In fact, he was worried she was still in the house. And as he's sitting up in bed, his mother comes running into the room. She looks disheveled, she's half asleep. And she's like, was that, was that you? Were you running around the house? I could have sworn I, I heard someone running around the house. Was that you? Nathan's looking at her and he can't even process what he's been through, whether that was real, whether it was a dream. And he's trying to find the words to describe to his mom the dream he had, but like he just, he can't, he can't process what's happening. And he just says, Mom, we have to check the house. We have to make sure no one's in the house. And so the two of them flip on every light upstairs. They're not even talking. At this point, it's survival mode. They turn on all the lights upstairs and Nathan leads the way down. And they're flicking on all the lights and they manage to search the whole house and there's no sign of a break-in. There's no one in their house. After the coast was clear and they felt like they were not in immediate danger, they went into the kitchen to kind of talk about what just happened. And so Nathan's like, okay, Mom, I... I just gotta tell you everything that I'm thinking right now. I, I can't really process what just happened. I think it was a bad dream, but I'm starting to think that it could be something else or I'm just losing my mind. So a few months ago, I was sleeping in your guest room in your apartment and I had an experience that I'm almost positive was sleep paralysis. You know, I, I was laying there, I couldn't move and this figure was in the room and they were standing on me. It was terrifying, but it, it sounded an awful lot like sleep paralysis. But then I, a couple months after that, I talked to my sister and I told her about it. And she told me that very recently, right before you moved into this house, actually, she was in that room and she also had basically the exact same experience. She had never had sleep paralysis before. 
I had never had sleep paralysis before. So we basically had the exact same horrifying experience in the same room around the same time. And then just now, tonight, I had another sleep paralysis experience with the same woman who was running around the house and you just said you heard her running around the house. His mom looked really concerned, but she wasn't shocked. She says to Nathan, I have seen this woman. I saw her in my apartment way long time ago, but I remember what you're describing. That's the experience I had. This woman, you know, showed up in the room and she stood on me and, and I, it scared the heck out of me, but I, I didn't tell anyone because I thought it was sleep paralysis. And so Nathan and his mom proceeded to spend the next several hours just talking through what this could be. How could they, all three of them, you know, him, his mom, and his sister, how could all of them have had the exact same experience? And how could tonight, when Nathan had this experience, how could his mom have heard those footsteps if that was indeed sleep paralysis? Because it wasn't Nathan, he was in the bedroom. And it wasn't his mom, she was in her bedroom. And she didn't have any pets, so who could it be? Nathan says he and his family are still totally rattled by this experience, and they don't have an answer. And this is a family of skeptics, so they're not looking for a reason to call this paranormal. They simply don't have the answers. Nathan has said that he, his mom, and his sister have not had any further experiences with the woman in black ever since that last experience Nathan had, and they're just hoping it stays that way. So that's gonna do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments what it is and where you found it. Give us the timestamp. And if you're the first person to do that, we will pin you at the top of the comments section. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please eat all of the like buttons Oreos except for one and then put the box back in the pantry and then also crumple all of their potato chips. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly three, four, even five video uploads. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter where my username is the same. It's johnballin416. I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. If you have a story suggestion, and in fact, today's top story was a user suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.